We're going to look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 2. In the Bible, it always commands us to be happy. It says at 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, excuse me. No, rejoice evermore. Excuse me. That's 1 Thessalonians 5. It says to rejoice evermore. And then in the book of Philippians, it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. But let's be honest. When a Bible-believing Christian, he's going through life, and then when he goes through life, there's so many different attacks. One, you got uh, criticisms from family. Another thing you got, you got stress from the kind of work or study that you're going through. Another thing is that you're worried about the future. So then your future plans are failing. Another thing that the devil conflicts you, I mean, welcome to America. Everyone's going through all this kind of stuff. A million things in our head and we get depressed and sad. Future, what's going on? Financial difficulty. Another thing is that not only family, but probably going through divorce. Another thing is that, I mean, look at how many things, right? You got so many things complicating your life. You got temptations. Does this look like a happy person to you? It's going through so much hardship. That's why, why do, what do people resort to with all this kind of stuff? If you got so many things attacking you, what can you do to escape all this? That's why they'll turn to what? They'll turn to sin. They'll turn to the world for comfort. They'll do something that makes their flesh feel good. So you can escape all that. That's why they keep doing this if they're going through problems. That's why they'll do this if they're going through problems. That's why they'll go through the pleasures of sin, something sexual, to escape their problems. That's the reason why they will make a lot of friends with worldly people. And they don't care if they're worldly or wicked. They'll just be friends with them because they need someone they can cling on to. So the thing is this, is that that's what people resort to. But here's the thing, is that this thing can never give you joy. And I'm going to show you a verse on that one. But first of all, I'm going to give you methods to get you joy, what you got to do. Acts chapter 26, verse 2. You won't be depressed unless you think you're depressed. See that? Unless you think that you have it hard. Unless you think that everything's wrong with you. But look at Acts chapter 26, verse 2. I think myself what? Happy King Agrippa. And you got to realize this. Paul was in prison for one to two years. You think he's happy? But he says, I think myself happy. So what's extremely important that in order to escape all this, I'll tell you what you need to do. Do not turn to this. You need to turn to the promises of God. And God's promises are all over. There was one sermon. Uh, some of you have heard me say this over and over again. But there was one sermon that I cling on to the most. That was the most important sermon in my life, which made me never quit. And it was counting all the blessings of God. I did a sermon on that. And when I looked at that, I realized how much I'm giving up and how much life, great life is and how good God is to me. And when I keep looking at that, then I realize that I don't, get, I don't have any reason to be sad. But the first thing is you've got to think happy. You know what your problem is? You feel sadness. And, you're, and because you feel sadness, you're too... Uh, I'm just going to say this, that way I can kind of preach... All right? But I don't mean it in a min mean way, so I don't want people to un misunderstand. But you're actually too lazy to stop for a moment and then just sit down and think about all the good things God's been good to you with. That's right. All you are is, oh, thank you, brother. So all you are is overrun with emotions, you see that? With all these floods of emotions and these things going on, no wonder you're going to get sad unless you take time to stop and go away and what? Use your head. And think on what God has been good to you. Think on what could have happened to you if you never stayed in the promises of God. Think how God's going to work it for good. And think about that, uh, what the verses say in the Bible. Think about, remember the preaching you've heard, but I guess we're too 
fleshy and stupid to even remember that or play it again? See, that's the thing. We don't take time to do that. Take time to be holy, as one hymn says. Sit down, ponder, and meditate a bit. We got to do it. Another thing is this, is that we also got to look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we will read verse 25. Hebrews 11, 25. So why can't this work? I'll tell you why it can't work. Because of Hebrews 11, 25. That's why this thing doesn't work. You know what Moses chose? Choosing rather, meaning better, he preferred. Preferred to what? Suffer affliction. See that? He chose to even be in here, suffering problems. Then to what? Notice right here. Then to enjoy the pleasures of sin. See? He even preferred this one than this one. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because this one is, I mean, you know this too, because you turn to this so often. For a season. It's temporary. And you know that. You know why? Because this is not enough. You have to keep doing it. You know why? Because this is not enough. You have to keep doing that. You know why? That's why you have to keep turning. And guess what? It gets worse. When you get deeper and deeper into this, then you become addicted. And then it, it hurts your life. And it even damages and makes the problem worse, you got to understand. Because sin has to reap its consequences. Let's also look at several more verses about being happy. I mean, you've got to realize you've got the joy of the Lord in you. Amen. Look at second, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. How to be happy, right? Oh, I can't be happy. Yeah, you can. Look at 1 Peter 1. So think about all the promises that God has blessed you with, right? 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will read verse 7. So here's another thing that you can use. The Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye, present tense, rejoice. Why? With joy, what? Unspeakable. Look at that. Untelling joy. Unspeakable joy. And full of glory. Well, I sure don't feel like that at verse 7 with the trial of my faith. You know why you don't feel like that? Your problem is this. Your problem is that the reason why you don't have joy unspeakable is you don't look toward how God's going to use the trial. That's good. For example, it's easy to whine about a final exam, but it's another thing that you look forward to how it's going to be used where you get your diploma, your degree at the end. Uh, you're looking forward to the stuff that's what's going to happen in this. Uh, another example is like the job place where it's difficult and hard and stressful. But you look forward to the end result of how it can be used to make your life better and making good money, etc. Uh, there's a lot of other things, but you got to realize this. If everyday life people see that. I mean, you got to understand this. There are people, actors and actresses, who go through tremendous trial just to hurt themselves. And they go through poverty, waiting on tables. Why? Because... They want to become a celebrity star at the end. And what are the chances of that ha happening? Very zilch. Very small. You have to be incredibly lucky. But yet, those people will be willing to sacrifice just because they want that end result. And you Christians, it's not a slim chance. It's a guarantee that you're richer than any celebrity when you go through your trial. See, you just have to, you don't look forward to that. That's why you'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because you look forward to that result, what God's going to do with you. Let's also look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll look at verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. You know why you should be happy when these things start hitting you? You say, how can I be? Because... One, you're not here, praise the Lord, where it's temporary and it's going to hurt your life. Two, 
Think about all the promises that God has given to you. People don't count their blessings. Count your blessings. Stop and think. Also, they don't think about how God's going to use it for a better gain at the end. But not only that, you got to realize this. You ever wonder why I was able pre to preach and teach good? I don't like saying this, but this is so true. If I ever, if I ever preached or taught something great, it's because it was because of this amount of stress, pressure, and suffering I went through. That's when I created my best sermons, my best teachings. That's why I'm able to know all this stuff. The reason why I know all this stuff, yes, I got the knowledge when I was trained by un great, other great men of God. But it really became experience when God made these things happen and put me through tests. So you know what I gain at the end? Power. Do you want God's power? You ever saw these Great Awakening Revival peoples where they got thousands saved, where prayers were mightily answered, where God was just in them all of a sudden that the enemies feared? That power comes through great amount of suffering, you understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made what? Perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Here's another thing that you got to understand. The reason why you can be happy. Now this is rich. John 16 is rich about sorrow and joy. Sorrow and joy. So I can go on and on about this. But you, you can read that one if you want. But another thing is this. Is that in John chapter 16 and verse 21. So I'll put that with 1 Peter 1, 7 through 8. John 16, 21 gives the greatest example. It's a pregnant woman. Who wants to go through pregnancy? No one does. But why would they be happy to be pregnant, despite of all the trial and the pain? Because of the end result. I get a boy. I get a girl. See? That's the thing. Despite of the, It's like one of the worst pains a woman can ever go through, you understand. And, but because they want that gain so badly, see? They don't care about the pain and the trial that they go through. Let's also look at John 16. And so 21, right? A woman when she is in travail has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So that goes with that point. But here's another one. This is so rich, okay? Look at verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy, what? No man taketh from you. John 16, 22 is very important. How many blessings you got from God? If you thought about all the blessings of God, if you can count how many, which is innumerable, remember this. No one can steal them away. Bless God. That is something to shout your lungs out about. People get a billion dollars, they worry about losing the money. You, you can't worry about losing your salvation. You can't worry about God providing your needs, God taking care of you. All things work together for good. Your reward's up in heaven, and then dump all the worries at Jesus' feet. You can't. Because why? No one can steal it from the power, from the promises of God. Now let's look at verse 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your what? Joy may be full. So here's another thing is that in John 16 and verse 24, you don't even pray. Do you know how much prayer is like an ingredient in everything in life in solving problems? Look, if you want more money, did you pray to God about it? If you want a better school, better job, did you pray about it? If you want more people in church, did you pray about it? I mean, look, asking you shall receive that your joy may be full. And here's the thing. Yes, there's a lot of prayer requests that God might say no to. Then that's a time where you should pray even more, where you should find other things. Then, Lord, can you answer this one? Can you answer that one? Uh, maybe you can't answer it that way, but you can you answer it in this way then maybe? I mean, you gotta pray. This is you're so depressed and sad because when's the last time you talked to God? Lord, I'm depressed and sad. Will you help me out here? Show me what my problem is, why I'm depressed and sad. Prayer, prayer, man. You gotta pray. 
The best one is this, is that you'll notice right here that, uh, we, we won't turn to that one, but in we will look at one more verse and then we'll call it a day. But in 1 Peter 1, 7 through 8, so I'll repeat it again. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 through 8, there's another thing, not only God using the trial, but because there's one thing you've got to be excited about, His coming. Why? Because when He comes down, folks, when He comes down, He gives you your reward. Jesus is coming soon. And you know, when Jesus says, surely I come quickly, heaven is even closer in your grasp. And when you get heaven, game, game over. No more sorrow, no more depression. That's why He's coming. We're looking forward to that. He's coming soon. So, the last verse is Revelation 21. This one makes me very happy, actually, Revelation 21. Because let's assume I'm wrong about everything, okay? Everything I said was wrong. And you had every reason to be depressed and sad. I'm going to tell you people online, then go ahead, remain depressed and sad. Go ahead, keep it up that way. Because I promise you this, when you go to heaven, you'll never feel depressed and sad again. So take in all the depression and sadness that you want. Store it all up. Because guess what? You're never going to feel that again. So you might as well linger all that feeling, enjoy and gather all that emotion of depression and sadness and misery all you want, because you'll never even remember it again. <laughs> Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are what? Passed away. See that? In verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things what? New. Guess what? Bitterness, depression is impossible. Absolutely impossible for a saved Christian. That's what this verse shows. Because when you die and go to heaven, if you want to challenge God, you know, you heard me preach that sermon, right? If any of you are still bitter and mad at God and you want to challenge Him, you go on right ahead. You go up and I'll give you, I bet you, I bet you my fifth, uh, I bet you all my five crowns that you won't last 15 seconds with that bitterness. Because sights are too glorious and splendid and the feeling is so wonderful that you can't help but smile. And you can't get a frown unless you do plastic surgery on yourself up in heaven. 